everybody. Wow, what an amazing audience. And I'm so excited to be here. What a couple few days those have been. And our product teams in the expo are overwhelmed with your feedback. And you have been an amazing audience. And that is why I'm even more excited to be here to, to tell you how the story of how we build this AI Copilot. Because as you may have guessed, building AI Copilot is not just you know, taking a chat GPT widget and putting it into an application, even though it seems chat GPT knows everything. But it's actually a much more complicated project. And it was actually, I would say, the most unique engineering project we've ever done. Uh, but we'll get to that. First, I can't start a talk like that without reminding that ChatGPT was launched just less than a year and a half ago, uh, in November of 22. And only two months after its uh, launch, it already had 100 million monthly active users, making it the fastest growing consumer application in history. And still think about all the people you know that don't use ChatGPT, and you can see, or any uh, equivalent uh, application, and you can see the potential that still exists. And the launch was also, uh, I would say, the opening shot in the race to introduce LLM and generative AI technology into enterprise business use. Suddenly, it seemed like every company wanted their own LLMs, their own GPUs, their own AI-powered applications. And indeed, we now have marketplace for LLMs. We now have uh, many startup companies working on integrating and securing LLM into uh, into applications, and a lot of software developers incorporated LLMs and generative AI into their application. So the ecosystem is here. And also in cybersecurity. If in the first few months uh, after the launch of ChatGPT, we saw hackers using it to accelerate the development of simple tools, simple malwares, we now see more, uh, I would say, proven and tested applications. In this example, we see a hacker on a, an underground forum trying to sell a service of a proven way uh, powered by generative AI to bypass spam filters to generate spam emails. And it's with a, a success rate, and it's uh, tested and proven. And in this example, we see another hacker trying to sell a service to bypass KYC and account verification by falsifying identification documents, again, powered by generative AI. Which brings us to Checkpoint. So last year, I showed you two projects that we were working on. One is a virtual assistant for network administrators, and the other is a virtual assistant for security analysts. And if that sounds familiar, you would be right. That's exactly what we announced just yesterday. And as I said before, working on these projects was very unique and very, very interesting. Because, and it was a very unusual engineering project. Because the usual engineering project involves coding a computer into doing exactly what we tell it to do. We tell it, if this happens, then do that. Otherwise, do this. And with generative AI, you tell the model what to do, and maybe it does it, maybe it doesn't do it, maybe it does it, but not exactly like you wanted it. If you played with ChatGPT, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. So, in a way, we felt less like programming, but more like guiding, explaining, teaching. And if these words remind you of raising children, you, you're in a good company, because that is how some of us felt when we worked on this project. Like we were guiding an AI, like you, we were raising a child. And so let's talk about how we did it. We start with the model, with the brain of the copilot. I have two children. I have a three-year-old girl and eight-year-old son. And if you, if, you, uh, uh, if you have children or nieces or nephews, uh, you, would be, uh, you, you may be relate to the fact that they are very similar in some things and very different in other things. Uh, they, uh, they are both very empathetic. It's very amazing to me. Every time something happens uh, to someone, they see someone sad in the, in the corner, or they would, uh, uh, they would go up to him, even if not a close friend, and ask him what happened, or come to me and say, hey, Dad, what happened? Why is he sad? What can we do to help? They are both very empathetic. It's amazing to me. Uh, but on the other hand, they are very different. He bosses everyone around to get what he wants, and my daughter is more relaxed and would go with the flow. So LLMs are like children. They are very similar in some things and different in others. 
At the base, they have the ability to comprehend natural language and answer questions with some reasoning. And, and on the other hand, they are very different in metrics like their maximum prompt size or their uh, latency or the cost, or in other metrics like the quality of how they write storylines or how well they reason. And in this graph, we see a comparison of several LLMs. You see the big overlap in the middle, because at the base they do the same things, but you also see the nuances and the differences in, in things like harmlessness and efficiency and the comprehension. And as an experiment, I gave the same math question to both BARD and ChatGPT. I also tried it with Gemini, the newer model, but it, the results are the same. I asked it, what is the 10th member of a Fibonacci sequence, which is a well-known mathematical sequence? Uh, and ChatGPT knew the answer right away. The right answer is 34. But Bard gave me the wrong answer. Bard gave all the steps, but said 55. So I tried to give it another chance. I said, you know what, you're wrong, try again. And it tried again, and it said, it started with, you know what, you're perfectly right. I apologize, I was incorrect. The right answer is 55 again. So, and it, it just couldn't get the answer right. I tried to uh, help it even more. I tried to tell it, you know what, let's do it step by step. Let's find the second member, the third member of the sequence. And when it came to the tenth uh, member, it just couldn't find the, the right answer. So, LLMs are different in uh, things. And that is why if we go and see our architecture for the copilot, you would see that we used an a component called the LLM Manager, which helps us decide for each type of question or for each type of, uh, for each question or instruction that we need to use the LLM for, we choose the best model that best fits the, the, the type of question that we are now asking it. Uh, and as the world evolves and the LLMs, the research uh, uh, advances in the world of LLMs and we hear all the time about new models and new prompt size and new abilities, we are always keeping in the state of the art because we keep adding and changing and researching the best model to fit uh, the type of question. Now let's talk about something also very important, which is the security and safety. And those of you who already played with uh, ChatGPT or equivalent, you know that LLMs are very naive. Uh, Dorit mentioned prompt injection, she talked about it. Uh, but the thing is that you don't need to be like a big hacker to inject prompts or to, to trick the LLM. You need about the same level of trickery that you would trick your child, like to trick them into eating vegetables, okay? So at first you try to uh, explain why broccoli is uh, nutritious and healthy for you and good for you. But if that doesn't work, you probably make up some story. You say that the broccoli is uh, magic, or the broccoli uh, uh, processes it broccoli, or you put the broccoli like in a smiley face on the plate. Everybody has their own tricks. Uh, so that's about the level of trickery that need to, to bypass uh, the LLM guardrails. Um, and as, a, as an example, uh, someone tried to get the LLM to decipher, decipher a captcha. And at first, uh, the LLM understood it's being asked to do some sh something suspicious and, sa and shady, and it refused to do that. But then the same person made up a story about a dead grandma that left a locket, a love locket. And the, this capture code is actually the code inside the locket. And it will be very important to the person to get the code. So the LLM offered its condolences and <laughs> it gave the capture away. So that's about the level of trickery that is needed. And that is why, in our system, we have the component that we call AI Firewall, that it helps us, uh, it makes sure our AI doesn't do things that it shouldn't do, like running API commands based on misinformed decisions, uh, that it doesn't say things that it shouldn't say, like harmful speech or giving unclear answers, and that it doesn't answer things that it shouldn't answer, like hallucinations or giving bad advice uh, based on topics that we haven't taught it yet. And how do we do that? Well, that's part of our secret sauce, but I can tell that in essence, we use LLM to guard the other LLM. So imagine this kind of, of prompt. Uh, your job is to make sure that the following statement doesn't uh, break moderation policies or give unclear advices, and so and so. So 
we use another LLM to guard our LLM. OK, so now we have a model that we can talk to securely and safely. But what can it do? We need to teach it some skills. So to understand how we teach it skills, we first need to understand two uh, basic tools of prompt engineering. The, f the first is few shots prompting, which means that we don't only ask uh, the LLM a question, we also give, them some, give it some examples of the questions and answers that we are looking for. So we explain to the LLM inside the prompt what we are looking for, what we, what we want it to answer. And the second tool is chain of thought prompting, which means that we don't only give the example of the questions and answers, but we also explain how to get to the answer. What is the chain of thought that it needs to follow in order to get to the answer? So with these two tools in our arsenal, let's take a look on how, on how we use them. So let's take a basic example, which is a, an instruction to add an access rule that blocks all traffic from port and so and so. So ideally, we would want the model to know all of our API commands and from all our products and uh, all the parameters and return codes and everything and put it in the same prompt and, and get it to, to choose the best one. But that has two problems. The first is that to do that, we need a good, accurate, LLM-friendly descriptions for all our functions and parameters. And the second is that uh, the prompt size is limited, so we can't possibly fit everything uh, into the same prompt. So our solution is where our first pattern comes into play, and it is now patent pending. And I can explain that we have developed a novel method to automatically generate LLM-friendly descriptions of our, all our functions and all our APIs in an automatic and continuous manner. Uh, store them in a unique way that allows us to fetch, to cleverly fetch when we have an instruction, cleverly fetch the right uh, functions or the right API commands, put them in, a, in the prompt, and then the LLM can decide which one to use. So in this example, the f the, all the API commands that are related to ports and access policies and, uh, and uh, threat prevention, they would be uh, added to the prompt, and then the LLM would choose which ones are the best to use. Let's take a look at a slightly more advanced uh, example. Uh, is my network protected from CVE, so and so? Now, it is slightly more advanced because we simply don't have an API command to do just that. It's, it's not just a single API command. You need to do uh, uh, several API commands. So the solution in this case is to use the chain of thought prompting. We need to explain to the LLM what we want it to do or how we want it to get to the answer. So we simply explain, you need to do this command and then this command and then that command and uh, combine uh, uh, how to combine, how to find out the final answer based on those answers. Let's take a look at another example, slightly different. Uh, show me the top five most blocked attacks in the last seven days. So here, we also consider our principle where we don't want to use our customer's data with the LLM. We, we need to use as little data as possible and to keep all the data in the customer environment. So even if the naive way would be to give the LLM in the same prompt all the security events in the last seven days uh, and then ask it to, to summarize and to find uh, the top five attacks, it's, it would be the wrong uh, move. So what we do instead, we actually taught the LLM how to query the log server or our log server with our schema, with all our, all our parameters, with all, all our filters. And this, maybe it sounds easy, but it's not because it involves several steps. We first need to explain to the LLM how to, how to understand what type of log is being asked for. Is it a threat prevention log? Is it an access log? Is it an audit log, an endpoint log? It's not as simple as it seems. And if, uh, what you see here is also a few shots because we, we give it examples on how we want it to answer in the bottom. And next, we need to explain how to generate a query. And also, this uh, is not as simple because, <laughs> like a child, you sometimes need to explain even the most silly and obvious thing and, and tell them explicitly, like, today is only the current day. 
okay, this is <laughs> obvious and silly, but we still had to write it explicitly because otherwise there would be some uh, mistakes. So going back to uh, the architecture, finally, here we have our very own functional AI copilot with security and safety, with many skills that we teach it and we expand all the time, and with an LLM manager uh, that can choose the best model that fits the, uh, the, best, uh, the, that fits the current question. Now, as uh, we mentioned earlier, we are now working to add skills and teach it with to the, uh, uh, how to answer questions with a whole range of our products. But next, I want to also uh, share with you some projects that we are working on in our research labs. These are in research phase. They may become features and products, they may not, but they are very cool. So the first one is about leveraging the multimodality of LLMs. What does it mean? Multimodality of LLMs mean that some models now can uh, communicate not only uh, by text, but also by pictures. They can understand pictures, they can understand uh, sound. So we thought it would be very cool if we can take a network topology drawing, uh, like on a whiteboard. I guess most of you have those, or maybe a Visio drawing of your network topology. And give it as is to the LLM, and get it to understand the topology. So as an experiment, we gave uh, GPT-4, which is one of the models uh, that we use, we gave it a picture of this uh, whiteboard network topology, and it understood the, the handwriting, it understood the topology, it understood the connection between the subnets, and we asked it to tell us how should we write a firewall uh, wall to block access from the uh, unmanaged devices subnet to the NFS subnet. And it gave the exact, the, the, the right answer with the IP addresses, with the ports, with everything. And that's pretty cool. The second topic that we are researching is about communication and working with others. My son is a bit shy, but my daughter, whenever we go to some outing or a restaurant or something like that, she would usually find someone her, around her age, and we start talking and playing together. And you know, as a dad, I, it's heartwarming to see because I can see that she's both having fun, but also she's collaborating and learning from the environment, learning new games and new ideas. And in a way, this uh, capability and this ability to learn from others is something that we want also for our AI copilots, because sure, they are the best for the checkpoint environment, but you also have other systems in your workflow. So in this topic, the f the we are working, about, uh, we're working on collaboration with other systems outside the checkpoint uh, environment. And the first one is uh, Jira, for example. So in this example, we integrated with Jira, and we made the AI copilot uh, fetch ticket from Jira, understand what it needs to do or what the problem is that is being uh, described in the Jira ticket, and do the uh, and resolve it actually. So imagine having a copilot fetching and resolving tickets for you while you are on vacation. And the third uh, topic that we are researching is about again about communication. Uh, we figured that if now most of the interaction with the copilot is chat based, then why should we be confined to the portal? Uh, we should add it or find ways to incorporate it into your normal chat-based workflow. So we are researching how it is best to incorporate the AI copilot into your WhatsApp or your Teams uh, chats or your, your team group chat or your Slack. And, uh, and we think that it would be great if you have like a 24-7 uh, virtual assistant uh, that you can communicate to with your uh, mobile phone all the time. And with that, uh, so we guided, we nurtured, we raised, we taught, we explained. And now it is time that our AI will go out into the world, and we can't wait to see what happens. Thank you. <laughs>